Hey guys and welcome back to another YouTube video. In this video I'll be going through my BBL Supercoach tips and tricks just to get started. I know the uh, team picker opened yesterday and I did do my first team reveal. I know a lot of the other content creators are getting around it and they're going to get it up and going um, or their series on the weekend or so. Um, but I thought I'd just release this video now that I have a little bit of time just sort of uh, reiterating my tips and tricks from about uh, nine or ten months ago adding a couple more and sort of uh, not modernizing but sort of updating I would say the tips and tricks with regards to the 20, uh, 24-25 campaign rather than the 23-24 campaign but anyway let's just jump into this video um, so the first tip is that we always know, and I will be saying this countless times throughout the preseason, uh, just it's, it's on record, it's, um, there's so much historical data that you can go back to and, and it will show this with the current scoring system, bowlers outscore batters on about a 55 to 45 split on non-fielding points each year. Um, this is like epitomized by the top 10 to 20 scorers each year consistently being all bowlers or um, I should say I should preface that by saying it's not there's no batter onlys in there other than Lynn and Munro for the past two or three seasons if I go back to this and I actually show you guys on here I can give you that uh, I can show you this from where is it past seasons does this give me just 23 24 okay if we go average here you'll see um, the best if I just go batters um, and just go here, you'll see the best batter only is Chris Lynn at 67, so remember 67, and then the next best batter only is Max Bryan on 49.5, but he's like got two games, so you can almost disregard that, and then Steve Smith on 48, but he's had two games, minus, Lab, uh, minus Labashain, two games for 47, so you can basically disregard that, and then Laurie Evans, 10 games, 46, so if you remember that, 46 and, uh, what was it, 46 and 67 effectively are the two players that have had just a non-outlier result, I would put it at. Now we go over to the full thing and you'll see Chris Lynn, sixth uh, for points uh, in terms of his uh, average. And then we scroll all the way down to, what was it, around the... 30 marker for Laurie Evans. Um, where's Munro? I just want to check where is Munro because Munro is one that always uh, that has seemed to uh, push the boundaries as well. He's actually at 44, um, so he's around that 35 40 marker for um, positional for non uh, yeah, 35 for average. And then that is my point right there in terms of um, the, the batter's only just do not score well um, because. It's just a factor of the matter that they, um, like, look at this. You can also see the really um, poor players in terms of the guys that didn't score well, um, that played multiple games. I mean, Joel did, I think, bowl a little bit, um, but he was batting well down the order, just didn't really get a roll. Uh, Gilks as a batter only. Uh, well, he was keeping, I think, a little bit. Harper, a keeper, that was just struggled with the bat. Turner, struggled with the bat from three games, stackity bowler. Harry Nielsen struggles with the bat, so that's pretty much all exclusively um, keeping points. Nick Manitson struggled with the bat. Curtis Patterson struggled with the bat. Mackenzie Harvey has struggled with the bat. Wes Agar, he's just iffy if, if in general. And then you have some bowlers here. Um, but then you all you start getting back into batters here. Again, Matt Renshaw, Tom, um, Tom Kelly, both of them are quality players, but even Caleb Jewell was doing really well, but even he, just Tim David as well. Look at all those batters. That even Tim David, I think, might have bowled a little bit. But you can just see how it is. A David Warner as well in, in this short time. Jason Sanger, uh, Nick Hobson, Ollie Davies as well. You just see that's just all quality batters just sitting there as well before you get to these bowlers. And, and that is just the case that a lot of the batters sit in this sort of 45 to 70 range in terms of the point scoring uh, for the average for the year because... Those um, those zeros or sub ten scores with the bat really are not weighted evenly compared to like a one for sixty or something like that, or a one for forty with the ball. With one for forty with the ball, if you go one for forty with the ball, you're probably still going to average somewhere in this range, if not add maybe three or four points per game on with the uh, in the field or something like that. 
or even an economy rate bonus in the occasional game that you play, and you start averaging just in the mid-30s, just from a 1 for 30 or 1 for 40 with the ball regularly. Um, and that's how these guys score, um, how the bowlers score really well. But anyway, that's just sort of that point uh, there. Um, and therefore, uh, the point with the team picker is, and you'll see this throughout my whole um, preseason, I think, is just that all bowlers um, can be placed within the batter slots. Um, unless they're on the, the bench, on the double or cash generators, you'll see that. And I'll flick back to my um, current team build, which I don't think I've changed. All bowlers, I said, um, unless they're on the double um, or cash generator or on the bench, uh, sorry, all batters, um, you can see cash generators on the bench and they have uh, doubles coming up, I believe. Um, let me just double check that. When is the Thunder double, which we'll get to? Thunder double out there, that's not good. Um, and then there's that, okay. Um, so there's, there's that point there. Let me just go back here. Um, number two is that you can exclusively bring in bowlers each trade uh, period. Um, and that's pretty much, uh, uh, that is conducted uh, as they'll score more than likely. Um, it's not saying that they'll exclusively score more points than, um, than batters. That is not something that you can just confirm by just bringing in bowlers. But I think it, it's just more about playing the odds. And the odds are that bowlers will outscore batters every single time. Because we've seen that in that pretty much you need something around a 200 score or something like that. And have only about 7 or 8 wickets in the game for batters to outscore bowlers. So you need somewhere around 400 runs scored and only seven or eight wickets for, or something like that, for bowlers to be outscored by batters. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something crazy like that just because of the way the bowlers uh, score is um, added um, up compared to the batters. And uh, so I'm not saying it's a 100% chance, but I'm just saying it's a very likelihood chance that um, batters will be outscored by bowlers regularly, and that's how you make your, you're not, uh, that's how you make smart decisions, I would say. Um, and this is purely down to the fact that one for 60 or four overs is more than likely to be the same as a 20 off 16 with the bat. Or um, expand that to a two for 45, which we've seen so regularly, a bowler gets smacked around for three overs, comes in last over the, of the innings, takes two for, and then um, that is the equivalent of like a 30 off 21 or a 20 off 12. And I can expand that to say even a 2 for 60 doesn't really make much of a difference compared to 2 for 45 unless you just take away the dot balls, which like 5 points, give or take. Like that's still, that could still be like a, a, a 2 for 60 could still be valuable as like a 30 off like 23 or something like that that gets into that. Um, that gets into that 130 strike rate bonus. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, then the next step we, well, the next uh, tip and trick is about planning. And this is a heavy one that I'll go into particularly. Let me just switch over to this one. This is how I sort of planned for last year. Yes, this is 2023, 24. So I need to update this and I'll pretty much take this and just, change it around because it's pretty simple. So don't take this exact one. I will update it and then I'll put it on um, a global Google uh, sheet for you guys, um, as well as the how I set this up as well. This will be pretty easy to change over and I'll change some things as well. So to make it um, easier to actually uh, give you guys the uh, protected, projected price change um, as well as um, a price changer where you can sort of uh, model it, etc. Uh, so I'll do that in the uh, month and a half that we have. I think it's 58 days, I want to say. No, not 50, 48 days, sorry, till the uh, first ball of the season or somewhere around that marker. But yes, I will be doing this. This is how I sort of plan for it and how I um, get ready for the season, I guess. But anyway, let me just jump back in here. I can uh, put this over here, that would be better, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's how I sort of uh, plan for you guys there, but yeah. Um, but this allows you to plan for the doubles, as you see here, the, uh, the mass double last year was this, um, and then you also were able to plan ahead, I think, um, at least 
you sort of plan um, each individual team across the year, but you as you see here, um, you plan uh, Melbourne Renegades, you sort of plan mostly around their doubles um, and around their buys. You sort of look either side of them, I would say, almost, um, and sort of look how it's going to set up. And that's it. Was it especially crucial for the Perth Scorchers in the end? As I held, I think, two throughout this uh, double here. I held two throughout the double uh, no game week uh, that they had, the four and five no game week. And then I went bang and was able to really capitalize them being a really good side on their double in six and seven. Um, and then, yeah, this is just that massive XL that I was talking about that I will reset up for next year um, for it. And uh, yeah, I've also heard some of the content creators say that they work in three week chunks. And uh, the reason why I don't necessarily um, believe in that theory, even though I understand it, is just if you look at this um, and you look at say this here, this three week chunk, and I know I did this nine months ago looking at this exact three week chunk, you would stuff yourself over looking at this three week chunk here. Because um, even if you just say, yeah, I'm going to work on this three-week chunk here, um, you would probably stuff yourself over with this buy. But it's more, um, I think, in, um, in terms of this, that you would um, stuff yourself over in terms of looking at this three-week chunk uh, here and you would not be able to necessarily access, I don't think, um, all the points in these, uh, in these two rounds if you look at it in three-week chunks. So I do think you have to look at it within a season as a whole or look at it in terms of the individual teams and how you're going to set up because you're going to have outlier results in there. If I just go back to, I think it's on the bookmark here. So if we look at this, this is the, I think the confirmed um, BBL schedule and I will double check that and put it all, all into an Excel document for you guys. But if you look at that in terms of a three-week chunk, if you were to just go, yeah, I'm going to look at a three-week chunk here, bang, one rounds one, two, and three, and not look at rounds four, you would probably stuff up, I feel like, this Melbourne Renegades because what's the plan in the Melbourne Renegades? Um, in this round four, I'm just looking at this quietly here. I reckon this will, is where I'll play one of my uh, boosts here in round four, um, partially because in round four, you'll see uh, that <laughs> there's two, uh, you have to access both this one and this one. And if you think about it, you're probably gonna have to hold two Melbourne Renegades players potentially in this, uh, because I like to get up to four players. You're probably gonna have to hold a Melbourne Renegades in here, uh, just so that you can access uh, this round four and holding that will be crucial. Um, so yeah, you're probably gonna have like maybe, maybe two Melbourne Renegades here or three, then go down may have three maybe here, maybe two, then jump down to two here, I'd say, and then have, I think you're gonna probably start with two strikers guys, and then have two here, and uh, so you have four here, four here. So that's why I'm saying that working in three weeks chunks can sort of leave, can create blind spots, I think is the most uh, easiest way to describe it, I would say. Um, and then that will, uh, it, it becomes very, very hard to um, recover it, I guess, or you basically have to just kill off a round. And a lot of the time, those rounds are the most dangerous rounds. Those where you've got two or three double game week uh, teams on, and those are the most dangerous rounds when you uh, leave yourself with a big blind spot. Um, so yeah, pre-planning pre can make trades very simple and limits overthinking in my honest opinion. Um, so yeah, there's that one there. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'd want to say is that, and this one's going to be a tedious one to sort of talk about because of this new flex rule, and I think I've understood how it works, um, and I'll get to that in a second, but um, la one thing I did well last year was using emergencies through uh, buy players, like we talked about with the buy just recently in the planning section uh, with the Melbourne Renegades, you can probably use the buy um, to get that extra, to have an extra chance at a score, if you get what I mean, as well as using it to have potentially even a chance at a VC compared to a captaincy, especially maybe in um, in single game weeks. Uh, well, then again, you're not going to have the, um, in single game weeks, you're not going to have the 
uh, the team to uh, a team on the bye. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of just having emergencies, they work really, really well in the doubles just because they allow you to take to have more stabs at it, especially with these guys that have sort of iffy roles early on in the season or late on in the season when you have, um, I had a good about 600, 700k worth of players on the bench um, that can allow you to basically have a chance off with two sort of partial premium players, I would say, or sort of mid prices, um, and use them um, off against each other and sort of confirm points almost in a way. I know I did that last year with Dan Lawrence's 120 in the final round, as well as Ben McDermott's uh, 100 or something like that, or 80 odd, I think it was. That, no, I think it was 75. And then also... Uh, Stoinis is uh, 69, I did that. Uh, so anyway, let me just show you what I mean by that on the uh, video here. So you'll see here with uh, Sam Harper, say Sam Harper's not playing and I had maybe another, uh, say I had another wicket keeper in this uh, Turner slot. Um, I would probably have done something like, and Philippi plays early. You'd play Philippi in the emergency slot here. Um, we'll just set that for the time being. Um, you you play Philippi in the emergency slot. If Philippi goes well, then you play. Then you'd have the dead Sam Harper or the by Sam Harper there, um, and then you wouldn't have to play this uh, wicket keeper in that slot. But if that was the case, um, if Philippi had a shocker, then you could just put add a uh, Turner or the sorry the wicket keeper equivalent equivalent sorry in this slot here, and then uh, Harper would go to that position, and you get a double chance of this. Now, with relation to the uh, flex uh, position, I think it adds a little bit more, um, I mean, it's in the name flexibility. I think it also uh, adds some comfortability with the uh, way it's sort of done and conducted in that you get 12 stabs at it. And to my understanding, actually, that if you had, a, say, a player that isn't going to play uh, on a buy, for instance, the emergency comes in, that score comes in, and then it takes the best 11 out of those scores. So it doesn't override, directly override the emergency is my understanding of it, which is the smart way to do it. Uh, because then it would just dis <laughs> it would just make emergencies pointless. It would be like a, it would be the only emergency, the flex, if it was that case, which is not. Um, so that makes it better. But that does open it up to actually having um to actually having yeah just an um, uh another guy on the field there so you effectively get three stabs at covering scores and this is especially going to be crucial in i think the big by uh double game weeks when you have effectively got um when you have effectively got the maybe nine or ten guys on the double and you're just trying to cover that last single game week and you effectively get three stabs at it for uh, a game week in in essence i think so like i was like basically let's look at it here with uh this uh example here so if i'm gonna uh yeah let's just go here so say i want the stoyness is is on the is on a buy and i'm trying to cover one score right so i can have a stab at ashton turner having a score right then I can have a, and this will be exclusively, it, this will be, you can fudge this around so much depending on who's on the buy, etc. Um, say Melbourne Stars were on the buy, then you'd be able to go, oh, I want, uh, well, Philippi's score would have to count anyway, so it doesn't really count uh, that matter. But uh, say I had only one Stars player in Stoinis, I could have a stab at Turner. Then I could be like, oh, um, for instance, Oh, Stoinis hasn't, uh, sorry, the Renegades haven't played yet. So I can, f I, I already know Turner's score. If I don't like it, then I can flip Will Sutherland into here. And then it'd be like, okay, Will Sutherland to, for instance, in this example is on the double. He's now that score so that I don't like Turner's score. I can have a stab at one of these two scores here. Um, and if that doesn't work, then it's, uh, then I can just take my, uh, whichever score is highest here into the into here and then also have the covering the 12th score of the flex in there so that it would be you basically get the worst outcome out of Turner 
say Salzman and also Fabian Allen in this example. And that's how critical that uh, that 12 scorer can be in that um, it basically yeah, becomes a um, an ability for you to cover the, uh, to have that big score in that slot, especially in the double game weeks where you have only one or two slots to cover out of single game week guys, you can get a big, big score in there. So that pretty much is the video there and my understanding, I guess, of the flex rule going through the tips and tricks for BBL Super Coach and how I sort of play it. But anyway, if you did enjoy the video, remember to like and subscribe, turn the notification bell on so you know when I upload and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye guys.